Imagine being healthy. Imagine being in the midst of your career. And then one day, finding out you have kidney disease and being in a coma. Today, my guest is Monica Fox, my friend and co-podcast leader in her own right, the Journey Continues podcast, and a survivor and a recipient of a kidney. Monica, welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you because not only do we do you have a singular journey, we have a journey together throughout organ and tissue donation that has been going on now for almost 10 years, I think. Absolutely, yes. (laughs) (laughs) And it all started, I'd like for you to tell the story about how you got to me and what happened after you got to me, but tell us a little bit about how you started down this trajectory. Sure. So uh, in late 2013, November, in fact, I was at work and I wasn't feeling well. And I hadn't been feeling well for a few weeks. I felt like I had a sinus infection. In fact, I had gone to urgent care. They had diagnosed me with that. and But my symptoms continued and I continued to get more short of breath and eventually uh, realized I, I needed to get some more attention. And so I went to the emergency room, actually left work and I went from, the, from work to the ER to the ICU all in one day. And it was very tragic. Uh, my sister accompanied me to the ER and they told her my kidneys had failed. And those words echoed in my mind when she said them to me and that they needed to put me into an induced coma in order to um, get my heart function stabilized and be able to move forward from there. So imagine that was really just a traumatic time in my life. And I wasn't sure what was happening, but I knew that God had a plan. So I woke up four days later in the ICU. I had my first of three years worth of dialysis treatments. And I um, said to myself, I said to God, what, what, why am I here and what is my purpose? I was told that if I hadn't gotten to the ER at the time that I did, I might not have survived. So I knew God had saved me for a reason. And I, had, I said, if, when I figure out that purpose, I will live that out. And as time went on, it became evident to me that I was meant to be an advocate. And so... Friends who knew I needed a kidney immediately said, you need to meet Jack Lynch. And Jack Lynch had been working for Gift of Hope for almost 30 years. And um, they introduced me to him. And I, I sent him an email and I said, how can I help? I understand that the wait in Illinois is five to seven years for a kidney transplant. How can I help? And he sent me back an email and connected me with you, Marion, and a few other people. And from that day on, we went to work. And for at least three or four years, <laughs> while I was on dialysis, I worked with you guys. I call myself a full-time volunteer <laughs> and shared my story and had all kinds of opportunities, thanks to Gift of Hope and you and Jack, um, to share my story with different audiences, uh, with the media, to create videos. And all those opportunities led to my life saving kidney transplant. And Monica, that's the one thing that I just love about you is one, your positivity, you know, but two, you didn't say, why did this happen to me? You said, how can, how can I help? What am I supposed to learn from this God? And one of the things that was just so transformative was your weight video that we did so that it really brought a different um, narrative to waiting for a kidney transplant. And can you tell us just a little bit about that PSA that we did and how it just helped so many people besides yourself? Yes, that was really life-changing for me and so many other people. I still today hear from people who were touched by that video and uh, by that PSA that we did focused on waiting. We talked about waiting. Everybody, we wait for everything in life. We wait for the train to take us downtown to work. We wait in the line for coffee. We wait at traffic lights. But many people don't think about those who are waiting for a life-saving organ. And so that video was shared all throughout social media. And so many people were helped by that. 
were encouraged to sign up for transplant and were encouraged while they were waiting. And again, I still hear from a lot of people who say how that really made a difference in their lives. And it really made a difference for me because um, I shared it on my Facebook and that's how people, so many people knew my story. And that led to me getting a directed deceased donor transplant. When you mentioned that you were a full-time Gift of Hope volunteer, and it's true, you went on so many journeys with me because I was new at that point to community outreach, to not organ donation, because I worked for Gift of Hope uh, for four years prior to moving over to Jack. And as we know, Jack is sort of, or continues to be a dynamo, um, but he really put us on a path to really be in the African-American community and set us up for success in all of the things that we did from Beauty and Barbershop for Hope, for Churches for Hope, uh, for Mayors for Hope, for which you were extremely instrumental in getting all the mayors from the South Suburban area to really take up our cause. Can you just talk about that a little bit and why it was so important to get those mayors? And you had over 15, so that was a lot. Yeah, so it was it was great to have the mayors participate because we know that when you go into different communities, people uh, trust who they know and they know their mayor. And so to have the mayors come on board and speak positively about organ donation and encourage their community members to be registered and really to begin to have those conversations was critical. Um, and so throughout the South Suburbs, now, organ donation is a regular conversation, and I see all those mayors now, and they still think I work for Gift of Hope, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they still talk to me about organ donation and uh, how impactful that campaign was. Especially as we talk about the numbers, right? The numbers, over 100,000 people waiting, 63% of those waiting are people of color. And of that 63% of that 100,000, 90,000 are just waiting for kidneys, right? So we got a lot of people waiting for kidneys. And then 63% of that 90,000 are people that are from the Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. And so what does that mean that, you know, we're continuing to have this conversation over and over again, and yet we still have a challenge with people in our communities uh, not participating in the process? It just means we have so much work to do. I think we've seen a real increase in the numbers of people who are registering to be donors, but there are so many more who need to. And it's really hard to offset the myths and misconceptions that people have held on to all their lives and that pass on throughout our, the generations of families. So that's why it's so important for us to continue in the communities uh, to start these conversations and to encourage people, and especially the younger people, to go home and share those conversations at home so that they can change the minds of those who are kind of set in their mindset about the things that have happened historically. And yes, people, you know, we, we say it, I think uh, the vice president Kamala Harris said it so succinctly. She is like, things have happened and people have a right and rightly so to be concerned about the myths and misconceptions. And one of the things that once you got your transplant you became even more high profile in the industry that we both are in, which is donation and education and awareness and registration. But tell us a little bit about the transplant because you have an incredible story of a gift that transcended states. Yes, so I call it Monica's miracle because it literally happened three years almost to the date of when I when my journey started. So I started in November of 2013 uh, with my tragic journey. Um, and then in November of 2013, at Thanksgiving time, I received a call from a friend who, who explained to me that a family that she knew was preparing to donate their loved one's organs. He was in Memphis, Tennessee. 
and they wanted to know who was going to receive his kidney or liver. And she called me to see if I was still waiting because she had tried to be a living donor for me and that had not worked out. And I told her, yes, I was still waiting for a kidney. And she asked if she could share my name and number, and she did. And so then the organ procurement organization there in Tennessee uh, took my information. They reached out to me and they reached out to my transplant center and they started to do the paperwork and figured out in the, and all the necessary testing and figured out that Milton was a suitable match for me. And so from, I think the first call came Monday morning and by late Tuesday night, I was on my way to the hospital to get my kidney transplant. And I woke up on the day before Thanksgiving with a brand new kidney and felt 200% better than ever before. And it was just truly miraculous and the best Thanksgiving ever. And Monica, I remember coming to the hospital to see you. Like it was, I was like, I got to go. I got to go and see Monica um, because we had just been on this journey and I was waiting and watching with bated breath to like, okay, when is she going to wake up? When is she going to be able to talk? And uh, I just was so excited to get there to see you. And you just looked incredible, right? You looked in incredible. Like nothing had ever happened to you. That's how good you looked from, you know, receiving the transplant. And you make a, a great uh, point about one of the myths and misconceptions. Black people want to know where their stuff is going, right? Always, whether it's furniture, whether it's clothing, we want to know where our stuff is going, right? And so for the family to really be cognizant that they wanted the organ to go to someone black or African-American. And a lot of folks don't know about directed donation. They don't know that you can uh, determine, you know, where the organ can go if there's somebody on the waiting list and like you were on the waiting list. And so would this have happened if you weren't on the waiting list? If I wasn't on the waiting list, I would not have been eligible to receive that kidney. And it's also important to say that the donor family asked their um, requester from the OPO if they could make sure that their organ went to a Black person off the list. And they were told that the list is blind. They don't know the names on the list if a person is Black, white, or other. So they weren't able to do that, but they did go on to explain to them if you know someone who is in need, who is properly listed on the on the transplant list and they're a suitable match, then they can receive the kidney. And that family shocked that day in the midst of the worst time of their life and took time to call around and found me and saved my life. And so, Monica, why is it so important to be listed if you have end-stage renal, renal disease? Well, it's important to be on the list so that you can get the gift that you need. Dialysis is a treatment for end-stage renal disease, and so is transplant. They're both treatments. Transplant is the best treatment. It gives you back really your full range of life. There's medication that goes along with it and regular lab testings and things like that, but you are not tethered to a machine for several hours a day for several days a week. And it really makes a difference. I was, I'm was i able to go back to work. Now I have a full career again. I'm able to educate others and really make a difference in the community. And I don't have to sit tied to a machine Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for four or five hours. And so that's a good transition into your day job and how we work with you all. Um, but tell us a little bit about your day job and why it's so important. So I'm currently the Senior Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. And I have the privilege to educate people in the community about kidney health and living donation and organ donation and all that goes together with that, all the treatment options and things like that. I get to walk together with people who are going through the transplant process. So it really is a gift. Um, and I am, and I feel so grateful uh, to have this opportunity. And we work very closely with Gift of Hope as a partner. Um, 
doing programming together and um, just working together, supporting each other's mission. Um, and often we're in the same places, educating the same people, but the story all goes together. And it is just, you know, it's awesome to be, to have that partnership and to be able to work together to do this. I really like the fact that you all are really on the front end and on the prevention end, right? Because a lot of times we don't have marginalized communities know how to advocate for themselves to know their numbers. And so you all have the amazing kidney mobile where you go out and you test different people in the community. So tell people about, you know, what that involves and and how they can advocate for themselves through your incredible organization. Sure. So we have a kidney mobile and we go throughout the state of Illinois, working with different partners um, to come to their community and do free kidney screenings. And these are comprehensive kidney screenings. We test for high blood pressure and diabetes and kidney disease itself. So we do your analysis, we do blood pressure testing, we test your blood sugar and BMI. Um, We can do a stat um, blood draw, just like the blood draw that they would do if you showed up at the doctor's office or the hospital um, that will tell you, in fact, if you have kidney failure, we do that if, or kidney disease, we do that if there are any abnormalities in the other tests. And when a person goes through our testing, they receive a printout of all their results. They receive a comprehensive consultation with the medical professional before they leave. And if there are abnormalities, they receive instructions on going back to their doctor. Or if they if they don't have, if they're not connected with insurance or a doctor, then we help, you know, to guide that and try to make sure that they get to the care that they need. And there have been times, Marion, that we have seen people at our kidney screenings and had to send them right to the emergency room and their lives have been saved because they were either unaware how high their blood pressure was or how high their blood sugar was or that they were actually in kidney failure. And Monica, why are those numbers so important? The fact that you might have to send somebody like right then and there to the ER Why are those numbers so important and what do they mean for people if they're not uh, managing them? High blood pressure and diabetes are prevalent within the black and brown communities. We know that. What most people don't know is that when those numbers are uncontrolled, they can lead to kidney disease. And so when your blood pressure is too high or your blood sugar is too high, it is affecting your kidneys, which is a filter that's filtering out all the toxins uh, in your blood. And if that's not happening, the toxins are building up in your system and you're just getting sicker and sicker. And oftentimes that sickness is not felt until way too late. And so Monica, for you, you had no idea that you had those symptoms, right? Right. So I did not have high blood pressure or diabetes, but I had been told in retrospect This is what I recall and what I now know. Um, I have been told on several occasions that I had protein spilled in my urine. And so I would go for my annual physical. A few times I heard it there. A few times I heard it when getting worked up for some sort of elective surgery or something. And And then they would explain it away. I never knew that that was a sign of kidney disease and that I should have asked to be tested further. And because I was young and because I got married and I moved around, we moved from Chicago to Boston, Philadelphia, you change insurance, you change doctors. And I should have been the one to advocate for myself and carry that information forward. And I did not. Every time they said it and every time they explained it away, I was like, great, dodge that bullet. I know now that was the start of kidney disease. And so they never told you. And can you tell, you know, the audience what protein in the urine really means? We talked a little bit about why you should know those numbers, but that's a big one if you have symptoms, because we know that hypertension, you don't really get symptoms. um, And so it's a silent killer, but it seems like protein in the urine 
is a big challenge for people who don't have any symptoms at all. Right. So protein being spilled in your urine, protein is something that should not be able to get through your kidneys. So your kidneys like a coffee filter and the coffee filter holds the grounds and lets the water go through. Well, when you're ca- if there's a tear in your coffee filter or if the filter's holes are too big, then the grounds can slip through. And protein is like the coffee grounds. It should not be able to slip through the filter into the urine. And that's what was happening to me. So obviously, my kidney was not functioning at 100%. And no one ever expressed that. They just explained it away. And I just kept going on. And that was probably over a 10-year period of time, at least. Wow. I love that you explained it that way, because uh, sometimes, you know, when people go into the hospital or they go into their doctor's office, they don't want to ask questions, right? They don't want to feel like they're not smart enough to understand what the doctor is saying. And so, like you said, they just explained it away. Oh, it's nothing, but we'll just we'll just um, monitor it when you come back next year, right? And you monitored and monitored and now you're 10 years later and you wake up and you're in a hospital. And I love how you said you went from work, you went to the ER and you went to ICU and you were in a coma all in one day. And that is um, something that happens to a lot of people. They wind, wind up on emergency dialysis. Yes, yep. Yeah, so it's it's really important to pay attention and to be your own advocate. Um, we have a class called Take Charge, and it's take charge of, of your health, take charge of your kidney health. And we teach people how to advocate for themselves, how to make a list of questions that you have before you go to the doctor. We all get nervous when we go to the doctor. We don't know what they're going to tell us, but it is a two-way, it's, it's a partnership between you and the doctor. And you have to participate in that. So being prepared with questions um, and or having someone go with you who will ask questions for you if you're too nervous to do it for yourself. That's all very important. And so, Monica, we sit on a task force that we were appointed to by Senator Maddie Hunter. um, And it's all about kidney prevention and education task force. And can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be on that task force for all of Illinois. This task force is meant to try to find ways to help improve kidney health in Illinois. Kidney disease is the eighth leading cause of death in the state of Illinois, and it's preventable. So we need to find ways to raise awareness and increase prevention So that, you know, if we raise awareness and people learn that they can slow or stop the progression of kidney disease, if they change their lifestyle, change their eating habits, exercise, those kind of things, if people learn those things, then we can decrease the numbers, the numbers that you gave of people who are waiting for kidney transplants, you know, because that's one of the ways to reduce the number is to stop the number of people who are, who get to the point of waiting because it's very difficult to have enough kidneys for everyone who needs a transplant to receive one before their last day comes. And that that's tragic. That's the story we don't want to tell. And we don't want to happen. We want everyone to be able to live a long, healthy life. So, With this task force, we're hoping to improve the awareness and the prevention and the early detection of kidney disease here in Illinois. And Monica, when you when you talk about that, you know, we know that every 10 minutes somebody is added to the list for waiting. And we found that during the task force and meetings that this is not just an urban city issue. This is an issue throughout the entire state. And so Senator Hunter, in making sure that this was something that was legislated and something that is really going to offer prevention to Illinois constituents, education, and also 
registration. We've seen in Illinois, you know, we have a fair number of people who are registered, um, about 7.2 million people. How do we utilize all our tools to get more people registered and to make the mission of Senator Hunter very viable in 2024 and beyond? Well, that's a great question, Marion, and that's uh, that's why she pulled us all together so we can we can figure that out. But again, um, all putting our resources together, all the great minds that we have on the task force. Uh, which include a couple of patients and some very smart doctors, I think that we'll be able to figure it out. Uh, But, you know, it's not an easy task and it's not something that's going to happen quickly. We had a couple of um, town hall meetings, one in Chicago and one in Rockford, to kind of hear from the people and share what, you know, what we've uh, discussed already. Um, And we will have two more in Southern and Central Illinois. Um, And through those conversations, um, I I hope that we will gather um, more information and be able to work together in order to, you know, kind of get out in front of this. But I think like, you know, the, the main key is for us all to continue to do what we do the best and, you know, get as much support and understanding from the community uh, that we can. Tell us how your life, your personal life has transformed as a result of now having the kidney transplant. Because of the transplant, I have uh, lived to see my grandson, uh, who's now three years old, uh, be born. I, if, if I hadn't gotten the transplant in time, I may never have seen that. Um, I my sister and I share a home and my nephew is now 17 and getting ready to graduate from high school. He was just a little boy um, when I was first diagnosed. My daughter was in college. I wasn't even sure I'd see her graduate from college when I was initially diagnosed and put into that induced coma. In fact, I asked when they said they had to put me into a coma, I said, who's going to wake me up? I have a daughter who needs me. She's in college. And the cardiologist said, I'm going to wake you up. I promise you'll go to that graduation. And I did. (laughs) So my personal life, you know, my parents are amazing. They were there to support me and care for me post-transplant. You can never think that, you know, you might have to go home to your parents. Um, But I went to their house. After I had my transplant surgery and they made sure I had healthy meals and everything and they're amazing. And now, you know, I'm helping them as they finally have fully retired and I'm able to be here to help them with what they need. That's so awesome. And I I can uh, testify that you have an adorable grandson. So he is uh, uh, just amazing and so handsome. (laughs) Thank you. Monica. What would you say to uh, people who are listening about your whole, you know, journey and how you've come full circle and how you just sort of came into this industry from a person who was waiting to a recipient to now um, a subject matter expert on all things uh, prevention, all things transplants, all things how you support other people in the community, because I've sent you quite a few people to have conversations with. Um, How did you take being that subject matter expert and what do you hope for people? So how do I take being a subject matter expert? I take it as a blessing. And I really, you know, really it's what I prayed for is that I would, you know, like I said in the beginning, that I would understand why God put me on this journey and what was expected of me. And so I do believe I am walking the path that was set for me. I feel blessed that I've been, that I have been surrounded by so many people, so much smarter than me to learn from, um, to be able to share with others and to be able to help with others who are along this path, because it's not an easy journey. And it wasn't easy when I was, you know, on the journey myself in the beginning, Um, but 
but because of the people that I met who walked along with me, um, I not only survived, I thrived. And that's what I hope for others um, who are on this journey, who are directed to me, who I'm allowed to walk with, to hold their hands, to just have a conversation. I hope that they will thrive through the journey and arrive at a place that they can feel happy and comfortable with. It has been a delight to have you on today, but more importantly, it has been a pleasure to walk alongside this journey with you, to have you help guide me as well as um, supporting you through your journey. And so these past 10 years have just been wonderful. Uh, and I call you friend and I'm very proud to call you friend. So thank you so much for today. Thank you, Mary, and I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Let's Talk Hope, a podcast devoted to sharing organ and tissue donation stories and turning tragedies into triumphs. If you like what you've heard, please listen and subscribe to Let's Talk Hope wherever you get your podcasts. We encourage you to start the conversation today about organ and tissue donation with your loved one and make your wishes known. You can register to become a donor at Gift of Hope. Org. Let's Talk Hope was produced by Ribbit 360. Thanks to Vice President of Marketing and Sales, Terry Lydon, podcast producer, Jennifer O'Neill, and gratitude to the Gift of Hope team, including Community Outreach Coordinator, Kleana Henderson, Marketing Communication Specialist, Emily Frederick, and Staff Assistant, Marva Siami. Ribbit 360 also produces Gift of Hope's Spanish language podcast, Hablemos de la Esperanza, hosted by Luis Ortega. And if you'd like to hear more great podcasts, please visit rivet360.com.